Hello. Hello, hello, welcome. Um, lovely sound to begin with there. Uh, welcome to our webinar on Gull ID. Now, this is a Zoom webinar. Uh, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone, but you will be able to ask us questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. We've got some time at the end for questions, um, but if we don't get to all of them, we'll try and answer them afterwards. The presentation is being recorded today. There's no chat function enabled for this event. If you have any technical issues, we do have the events team here with us. Um, they may be able to help, although for some Zoom related issues, they might not be able to offer support. Now I'm joined today by uh, Luke Phillips, who uh, worked for our team, Sports Publications. He's now on, on the campaigns team. Hello, Luke. Hey, Jamie, all right? I am good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I think, interestingly, yes. we've both got slightly croaky voices today, haven't we? So I know, I know. Another webinar. <laughs> we'll, we'll manage, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. So, Luke is here because he is um, a, a natural history expert, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, Luke, and um, very, very good on ID, much better than me. So, we're going to be looking at um, some gull species today. Gulls, I think, can be very confusing. Now, I grew up by the coast. Um, I've lived lived with gulls, lived alongside gulls, remember seeing them on the school playing field. But, you know, from a distance, uh, there's kind of black, white, grey animals, grey, black, white, and grey birds. And it can be really tricky to tell them apart, unless, unless you have some of the hints that we're going to give you over the next hour or so. Um, I think, Luke, probably the best thing to start with would be like a, a standard gull. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like Like you said, they're not they're not the easiest of kind of birds to identify um and yeah lots and lots of challenges but one of the one of the ways from so jumping straight in with the the sort of id sort of ideas here and and like you say it's it's good to get to know the most familiar species and that accounts for bird id across the board if you're kind of familiar with some of the, the you know the commoner species you've got a baseline of comparison and i and i often think that comp comparing is a really great way of of identifying a bird so no no different to gulls um and it won't be a surprise to anybody that we've picked uh the good old herring gull um as, as probably the gull that most people are familiar with um so like you say jamie if you're at the coast this is a, a really common bird um you know it's quite iconic actually i, I think the coast would be you know, a much sort of less interesting place with without the gulls. Um, I say interesting, uh, which covers a range of topics. For from my point of view, I love looking at the gulls and trying to identify them all. But but other people, um, you know, we can't uh, skirt around the fact that they will uh, pinch chips. And uh, I've lost a pasty and a sausage roll in the past to a to a herring gull. So it's happened to me. But I still love gulls. So that's that's all good. But yeah, we're going to start with the herring gull as the kind of key species that we're going to sort of compare against all the other species of gulls that we're going to see. So on here, this is this is the herring gull. Um, fingers crossed that this is a familiar species to, to most of you that uh, are on the webinar. Um, and by the way, it's amazing to see so many people here actually interested in gulls. This is absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, so you'd probably be familiar. So the, the big picture there is your classic white-headed, yellow-beaked, grey-backed, uh, black wingtips, it's got the pink legs as well. And these are all little features to kind of be looking at when, you, when you're thinking of gull identification. Um, the reason it's difficult to identify gulls is that when you start to go into the detail and you can see that bird in flight there that has lots and lots of speckling and patterns and browns and greys and blacks and bits of white, um, gulls change as they grow up. So they start off obviously as chicks. Um, you might be familiar with them when they're when they're chicks, they're all speckly, and then they kind of grow up to be what um oh, there we go. Perfect. There's a, a young herring gull right here. So quite different from that previous picture of that sort of grey backed, white headed, black wing tipped large gull. So looking at the features here, so where we've we've got the, the beak, um, it's clearly not yellow. Um, that's always a good clue on these sort of larger gulls. Think think of the beak. Um, and if it's not yellow, or in some cases of us, we'll see later on um, red, um, then it's probably not an adult. Um, also, the, the various speckles on the back there, you can see along the, the flank, the side of the bird, it's all brown and speckly. Then you've got the mantle, which is the, the back bit of the bird and the, the really keen eyed amongst you. If you if everybody kind of goes right up to the screen <laughs> to try and see this in detail, there's an actual difference between the mantle feathers and the side feathers, um, which are which are actually parts of the wings as they're folded up. 
Um, and the reason they're slightly different, one's browner, one's grayer, um, is because bird gulls molt and that confuses things even further. So as they molt, they change different feathers and it and all these little differences can help. Then we've got uh, just before the wingtips, which obviously the black bits that stick out, you've got a key feather called the tertial, um, which is mainly brown with those white sort of scraggy ends as well. And that's a good feature to look at gulls. Um, but generally, as we go through, yeah, we'll be comparing and kind of referencing back a little bit. Um, but just to show how gulls grow up, um, I, uh, I took the next picture um, in the car park at um, Radipole Lake Nature Reserve, which is, um, if anybody's ever been, um, it's one of the best places to watch gulls, or in fact, the car park of that nature reserve is the best place to watch gulls. Um, it's phenomenal, um, providing there's not too many cars in the car park, so mainly in winter, there's plenty of space. Um, but here we've got, working from uh, right to left, um, you can see that there's a bird on the right there with a, a much greyer back, but still got all that mottling on the side, still got the mottling on the tertials, um, but has its black black wings. If its beak wasn't tucked under its wing, you'd see that it's starting to go a titchy bit yellow, maybe at the at the very base, but um, certainly not dark like, like the previous bird. Then in the middle, we've got, um, so but by the way, the right-hand bird is a second winter. So don't worry about all these kind of complex details, but if your bird, your bird book will often say first winter, second winter, and all this sort of, this sort of gull jargon as it, as it, as it is. Um, so we've got the second winter on the right. In the middle is a third winter, and you can just about make out that it's still got some of the brown uh, on the side, just a little bit, and a bit of black in those tertials. And that's telling us that this bird isn't quite an adult. So this is a third winter bird. And then the bird on the left as, is the classic herring gull, as we all kind of, you know, are most familiar with. So that's kind of gulls as they grow up. So they take about four, four to even, even five years, the herring gull, to mature and become the most, you know, the familiar gull that we know. So it's, you know, it's a long old time. And um, yeah, they, they can live they, quite a long time. Yeah. Look, they're quite a long lived bird, the herring gull. Absolutely, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, they can live to in excess of you know twenty years. Um, wow. so they're, they're really long-lived birds, um, and that just goes to show you know the fact that they don't breed until they're four or five uh, suggests that they're a, a very long-lived bird. Um, and that goes for most sea seabirds. You know, um, herring gull technically is a is a seabird. Um, in inland these days, you do see more of them. I'll mention that in a second. But the seabirds in general, they 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 are very long-lived. I think there's a, a Manx shearwater, which is a you know another seabird. It's lived, to, I think it's, the record was about 56 or something like that. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, let's just, while we're talking about the fact that they're quite long lived, I think we should also mention that they are red listed, aren't they? They're, they're in trouble in the UK. They are, yeah. So the the kind of, the, the decline in herring gulls has mainly been our coastal populations. So lots of us are familiar with gulls because, you know, they might nest in towns these days and on roofs and things like that. Um, but traditionally, herring gulls would have lived on the coast um, and have, you know, links to, you know, they'd, they'd be living among seabird colonies. You know, they, they'd be pinching fish. That's one of their kind of roles within the ecosystem. They, they're kind of, you know, a bit of a scavenger. Um, and they go out to sea and, and, and scavenge fish as well. Um, but yeah, they, they've declined by more than 50%. So, you know, in, in a census in 1969, 1970, there was a big seabird census. Um, and by uh, 2000, um, in the next kind of big seabird census, um, they declined by well over well over 50%. And we think that they're still declining uh, these days on our on our coasts. Um, but inland, you know, they've, they've sort of had to adapt and find new ways of of surviving. And that's you know, essentially why in recent decades they've become a little bit more familiar in our, in our towns and, and cities. But um, they are in trouble. Well, so we need to, have, you know, extend a bit of understanding to these these birds. They they are they are struggling. Um, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Perhaps we'll talk about that towards the end, because I think there are probably other species that we're going to talk about that are in a similar situation. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah absolutely. I mean, I mean, one of the, just, just quickly, actually, because there's been a huge win recently, you know, um, RSV has been campaigning for, you know, decades on trying to um, ban sand eel fishing in the, in the North Sea. Um, and, you know, that's been a huge threat to many seabirds. Um, and that has now been banned, which is fantastic news, um, classically for puffins, you know, that you see with those beaks full of sand eels. So, you know, hopefully what we'll see is sort of coastal ecosystems starting to recover and herring gulls are kind of high up in that ecosystem. So they should start to recover in, you know, what will hopefully be, you know, the next five, 10, 20 years, maybe. But fingers crossed. It's good to have some good news. Let's move on to another really familiar species of gull. 
there we go yeah this is this is a hopefully another very familiar one especially if you're you know a bit of birding in your sort of coastal wetlands um they 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 can turn up in land as well at any sort of reservoir or or any sort of wetland or, or even farmland i've seen this uh the species feeding readily over farmland in winter so this is um what some say at this time of year is a very poorly named bird so this is the the black-headed gull um and you can see there that um you know it hasn't actually got a black head um which is which is because it's in winter plumage um so when i was kind of talking and probably confusing lots of people about the herring gull and the first and second and third winter and all that sort of stuff um quite a few gull species have a winter plumage and a breeding plumage that you'll see in sort of spring and summer um so that's just an extra layer of complexity for us to deal with. Um, but black-headed gulls, you know, there is a hint of a, of a black dot on that uh, that bird's head. Um, and if we actually go to the next slide, it shows it a little bit bigger. There we go. So you can see on that picture, it's a bit smudgy, um, but does have a black dot. Um, and this time here, actually, I, I usually use it as a bit of a sign of spring. Some of the, some of the black-headed gulls I've seen recently are starting to get a bit more smudgy on the head. So, you know, clearly gearing up for the breeding season. Um, but you can see that, so going back to that herring gull comparison, um, it's a much smaller bird. Um, they're quite, they're quite dainty, actually, I'd say, um, when they're flying around, um, they've almost got a, a sort of turn-like quality. Um, you know, if people have been to places like, you know, Minsmere Nature Reserve in, in Suffolk in, in the middle of summer, you'll see all the terns feeding, uh, over the lagoons and breeding on the islands uh, and they look super elegant in flight, but black-headed gulls have a little nod to that, um, I mentioned earlier on something about the beak, and this is one of the species with the red beak. Um, so that's a useful little tip. Um, and they've got bright red legs as well. Um, but, you know, I, I always think of this species as quite an easy one to ID because of their size um, and because of that sort of smudgy black head uh, and the red legs. So hopefully an easy one. But if we pop onto the next slide, actually, it's got a... Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures that I took at Radapo Lake. So there's been lots of Radapo Lake pictures, but this was uh, this is these are all the black-headed gulls that were lined up um, waiting to uh, pinch bread off the ducks that the, uh, the families were coming along every morning to feed the ducks. Um, obviously, bread is not ideal for ducks, by the way, just to put that out there. Um, much better to feed wheat and things like that. Um, but nevertheless, bread still gets fed to ducks, no doubt. Um, but the black-headed gulls were doing a great job of pinching it off the ducks. So there we go, kind of what comes around goes around. Um, but this was a midwinter shot, um, and you can see them all there with their slightly smudgy heads uh, and their and their red beaks. So, I think do we have another slide? Actually, yeah, we've, got, we... we've got we've got a summer plumage one here. And at we this do. point, just to give Luke a break, I want to insert my favourite black headed gull fact, which is that the the kiha, which is the gull in Watership Down, is actually a black headed gull. Oh. So there you go, bit of liter literature reference there. <laughs> nice. yeah anyway here's one in summer plumage yeah no no nice yeah keep the keep the facts coming no it's brilliant um yeah so this is this is um a much much more sort of summer plumage bird um with the 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 sort of well i'll say blackhead actually I mentioned earlier on about the name not really matching in the winter because it doesn't have the the blackhead in winter even in summer it doesn't really have a a, a black head as such it's more of a sort of dark chocolatey brown um so it's not quite as jet black but um but just to confuse things further i think it's uh it's either asia or maybe perhaps east africa there's there's also a brown-headed gull which is a species we don't get here so um, we can't call this one the brown-headed gull because that exists somewhere else in the world um but um yeah so nice black head very obvious one extra thing about this particular bird um i was talking about the sort of mottling on the on the flanks of the bird and looking out for that as a bit of a feature um, so that will tell you on this bird that is actually a first summer bird. So it's not a full adult. Um, a full adult would lose all that brown speckling on, on the side. Um, and if it was a little bit uh, more side on, you'd see the tertials are brown with white tips as well. Um, but um, but yeah, one, one of the most subtle features, though, which I really love, is their, their little bit of white around the eye. That's, that's quite sweet, isn't it, Jamie? That's quite cool. It's lovely. <laughs> now, we, we have got a, a, a similar species, which we'll, we'll have a look at later. Um, which confusingly has a blacker head, um, but we'll come back to that one. I think then we've got one final shot of the um, of the black headed. So this is this is it. This is how you will see them right now. They they won't be starting to change into summer plumage yet, will they? Mm, some are just on the cusp of 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 changing. Um, so all all almost, but I, yeah. So I'd say over the next few weeks, you know, it's something to look out for. Look out for that black starting to to molt through 
um quite quickly because uh yeah they'll be they'll be thinking about breeding but um but just something quickly on them another aspect to gulls that actually i completely forgot to mention so far is the fact that they they migrate um and i said that this is a bird that you know you might be familiar with in winter um at lots of coastal wetlands and along the coast and inland um many of our black-headed gulls um head off quite a long way to breed and lots go off to sort of eastern central europe some into scandinavia um lots will be moving all around the uk into their into their colonies which are quite scattered around um so odds are the birds you see you know along the coast then they're, they're not local at all um but they are incredibly faithful that's one of the amazing things so i I've been uh, ringing gulls for for quite a long time. So when I say ringing them, not phoning them, uh, I've been sort of <laughs> handling them and putting little metal rings on their legs, which have got a unique number, which is which is a good way then of uh, identifying that individual bird in, into the future. Um, talk about, about that a little bit more later. Um, but black-headed gulls, um, one in Weymouth that I ringed, um, I ringed it in, say, I think it was about January, February time. Uh, a couple of months later, it was uh, in Belgium. Um, where it presumably was breeding uh, and every single winter since and this is this is probably the last 12 years it's come back to Weymouth every single winter um, almost to the same post uh, in the harbour um, and then disappears off to breed again and comes back so um, you know I think that's really really a lovely aspect to gulls that you know they're, they're, there's more to them than what you you think. It really is now. I'm, I know I said we'd save questions to the end, some most questions to the end, but I've got a couple that are quite relevant now. So, okay, um, I know we were just saying that a lot of the girls, these girls won't be changing yet, but Rona is saying, I don't know where you're based, Rona, but Rona is saying she she's uh seen quite a lot with some plumage in winter. Well, so what's going on there? Are, are they a bit um, confused? Are they started early? Yeah, yeah, I mean, on a, as a general rule, um, they're they're only sort of just as a whole population starting to think about breeding now, but you do get some anomalies in midwinter. Um, and and regularly I'd see birds in Weymouth, you know, I mean, in in flocks of several hundred, there'd often be two or three that have almost a full black head, even in the middle of winter. So, um, yeah, they do break the rules for sure. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's quite hard to explain why that happens. Um, must be just be kind of a bit of an anomaly in that bird's kind of processes. But yeah, hard to explain. There's probably some very detailed scientific reason and some scientific papers out there that uh, um, now you've got me thinking about it, I'll have to research. <laughs> goals, goals don't follow the rules. Someone else has said, why do they change the colour of their plumage? I think that's such a big question. That's a whole webinar in its own. Um, oh, but presumably, yeah, yeah. they want to look at their best when they want to uh, compete for a mate or for territory or for nesting space. Whereas in winter, they can relax a bit more. Is it more energy to produce those, you know, more more colourful feathers? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a rule, I mean, yeah, the 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 you know the breeding breeding season is when they sort of come into their into their best, um, and you know that's undoubtedly to do with attracting mates and and that and that that sort of thing. Looking, you know, looking smarter than all your competitors because these are colony nesting birds, so there's lots nesting together. So you know, there's lots of jostling around, especially with black headed gulls in particular. Um, but yeah, in in winter, um, that's. It's probably a very complex question again, to be honest, as to why they don't have the full black heads. Um, but um, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I might. And that's a future, a future that subject. Further. Yeah, mm. I think that's a future subject for another webinar because we can well, say that lots of species of birds which which have their summer plumage. Um, let's move on because we've spent twenty minutes talking about the first two girls, <laughs> or literally the ones that are most common. But let's move on to one that's called common but isn't. So perhaps you can explain, Luke. Yeah, so this is yeah the the common common gull, which um, as it turns out isn't overly common. Um, so yeah, the name uh, the name common gull was well, I think it was sort of coined back in the seventeen hundreds um, by somebody who I can't remember his name, but um, it was on the basis that it was the most numerous gull that that person was familiar with. Um, but there's another a bit of a story around the fact that this you know the name common gull comes from the uh, based on common land or you know feeding out on on the common you know pasture land essentially farmland um which i think is quite accurate uh, because when you do see this bird it is often associated with um, inland um, and feeding on farmland so in winter they're distributed all over the uk um, but breeding wise you kind of need to be up in scotland uh, lots of the scottish isles uh, and even in the uplands in Scotland, upon the moors, um, common gulls nest in little colonies. Um, but so generally a winter bird that most of us are going to see. Um, so we pop onto the next slide. We've got the the comparison, which is really useful. 
So got the familiar herring gull there. Um, so this is slightly smaller, but not as small as the black-headed gull. Um, so that's a kind of key thing there. This isn't um, super small, but a bit noticeably smaller than the herring gull. Um, it's got a darker gray back, a um, little bit subtle, I know, but that's one of the, the keys to sort of successfully identifying gulls is, is starting to get a good eye for, you know, what we might think originally is quite small details, but um, they do matter with gulls. So they've got a different sort of slightly darker gray back. Um, generally in winter when we see them, it's got a speckly head. Um, it's got a little yellow beak and bright, well, fairly bright yellow legs. Um, but they've got an interesting look about them. And, and actually, if we move on to the next slide, I've got, um, there we go, the back to Radipole Lake Car Park. It's my it's my comfort zone, I think, that, that car you park. You should do a book on car park birds, Luke. I think that would be great. Coffee table. Can I just say with the legs, they look a little bit more green in this one, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And that's a winter thing again. Um, yeah. So, you know, the what we call the sort of the bare parts, the beak and the and the uh, and the legs uh, in winter they lose that sort of vividness um, and that goes back to that question you're on about you know the, the breeding plumage changing from summer to winter um, same implies for for beaks and, and legs actually they do get brighter um, so yeah so this is a this is a winter bird again mid, real midwinter so it is a little bit more greeny um, but they've got a, a really sweet sort of almost cute look about them and I think it's because of their eye um, this is this is an adult bird it tells us that because there's none of that brown speckling along the sides um but yeah that lovely little black eye which i think makes them look um incredibly sweet um and there's there's possibly the same bird actually that took off and kept snapping around on my camera um you see that black eye there but this shows another feature which i use quite readily on on um common gulls um in flight um and again this this is not the easiest feature to go on but it is noticeable next time you're out birding and you see common gulls um do have a look for this um, so you've got on the wingtip, you can see the black, but it's um, at the very edge of the wings. It's got quite a big um, white sort of splodge, um, white window, as we call it. Um, but um, that's that does stand out to me for, for common gulls, uh, more so than, say, um, you know, a herring gull flying around, which kind of has a similar ish pattern. You know, the grey wing with the black wingtips. It's got small little bits of white on the tips, but not much. Um, and the black headed gull doesn't have this at all. Um, it's just got a black sort of thin line that runs along the edge of the wing tip. Um, so that's that's another useful tip that hopefully helps people uh, identify uh, identify the common gull, um, which, as we know, isn't overly common. But here's a video anyway of a common gull on a common. <laughs> this is in breed. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very pretty gull. And if we were if actually if we were talking about gulls in summer, we probably also mentioned the kitty wave, which also I think has that lovely soft eye. Um, but that's for a, that's a future topic, that one. Let's yeah, move on now to um, lesser black that girl. Yeah, this is this is one of my one of my favourites, bizarrely. Um, <laughs> never really sure why, but maybe I'll explain somehow to myself as I as I talk through this. But um, but this is one of the sort of probably quite familiar gulls to a lot of people in that it's it's one of the bigger gulls. So I always think bigger gulls are just more noticeable because, you know, as you bird watching, you, you just spot them easier. They're very obvious. Um, they, they've they got a tendency, they, they live in certain towns and cities as well, um, which makes them again quite obvious. Um, but similar size to the herring gull, um, but clear differences uh, to the herring gull in that that the, the back, as the name suggests, um, is pretty dark, um, not quite black. Um, they're generally in the UK sort of dark gray um if you go to scandinavia interestingly they are actually black backed um in, in fact the birds you get in finland uh, are really really almost jet black they're really smart looking birds um but so you've got the, the dark gray back um again the, the nice white head what and beaks very similar to herring gull um legs on this one a uh, nice bright yellow um and that's a really good clue if you get to see the legs of the species nice and yellow um, as opposed to pink on the herring gull. Um, but generally, you know, going into real minute details here, which, you know, gull, gull lovers love to go into the details. Um, they're sort of a slighter looking bird than the herring gull. They're slightly longer winged um, and they, it just gives them a little more elegant edge to the to the sort of slightly uh, brutish herring gull. There we go. I've said it, brutish herring gull. That's uh, hopefully not, not too mean. Um, but again, back to Radipole Lake Car Park. It's um, <laughs> it's brilliant for gulls. And this is a this is a um, well, this is this is this will um, this is uber uber detail now. Um, but uh, as 
as you look at that bird, you'd assume it's an adult uh, lesser blackback gull because it's, you know, it's harder to see the, any speckling because of the darker back, but there isn't any on that, that bird's back at all. It's all one uniform smooth colour. So you'd think it's an adult, but if you look at the beak, there's a tiny little bit of black, which is uh, just towards the tip. And that just tells you that this bird is just just a little bit short of being a full-on adult. Um, but um, for that picture in particular, it looks really, really sweet. Um, but I, th I, th I think though, Jamie, one of the reasons I, uh, oh, this picture, you know, I, I find this one, this is where gull, well, gulls get particularly challenging. Um, this is a young, a younger, lesser black back gull. Um, and you can see what I was on about there. The adult has that nice smooth gray back, but this has got, if you look in, in carefully there, the sort of patterns um, that you'd expect on a younger one as well. Um, and the kind of smudgier head uh, it hasn't got a yellow beak as well, which is all indicative of a, of a young bird, but you know, younger, large gulls, or young, anyway, lesser blackback gulls, you're starting to kind of get into into sort of trickier territory. Um, but size-wise always helps. This is a big bird. Um, but yeah, if we pop onto the next slide, though, we've got a little video, which I which will actually explain something really quite interesting about this species. So lesser blackback gulls, to me, um, being down in Dorset, um, not many breed in Dorset. Um, Breeding-wise, you get lots in... Cities like uh, Bristol, uh, Birmingham, um, Cardiff, um, and one or two other populations in the up in the north of England as well, and around sort of, sort of around our coast generally, there's sort of smallish numbers breeding throughout. Um, but in winter, they lots of them migrate. So uh, down here in Dorset, when you start to see them, um, it's often around sort of late February, early March, when the first start to appear, almost out of nowhere. And to me, they're almost like you know the first swallow of spring. They're a real kind of uh, indicative spring migrant that's starting to come through. So um, I've not seen any, seen any around me all winter um, so far. So I'd expect if I'm keeping an eye on the local herring gull population down uh, down on the nearest uh, bit of beach, I might start to see one of these uh, migrating through. Um, and they migrate all the way down as far as uh, West Africa, believe it or not. So um, almost the same journey as a swallow would do uh, in the spring, um, lesser blackbacks are doing um, into the UK. But we do get some over, lots overwintering as well, so it's um, it's not a clear cut picture as to their migration, but um, but still amazing it's, nonetheless. It's part of why gulls are so fascinating, isn't it? They they break the rules. They don't all do the same thing. Even the ID is is not you know it. it we we can tell what species it is, but it's, it's tricky. There are little and little minute details. Let's just go. Can we go back to the previous slide? We've got a question from Sam, who says. That particular one that we were showing just before the video seems to have pink legs. Now, is that a juvenile or a winter thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lesser blackbird gulls only really get their yellow legs when they're pretty much adult. So, um, yeah, up until that point, up until about four years old, they don't have the uh, the yellow um, legs, um, which which does lean into the, the point around um, using the kind of size and structure of the bird as a kind of indicator of, of ID. So if you saw this bird, you know, on say Radical Lake Car Park, for example, with lots of other gulls, you'd notice that it's a big bird, um, you know, about the same size as the herring gulls that'll be around it. Um, but you could, you if this bird in particular was there, you'd notice that the back is much darker um, and that would tell you straight away that it's not a herring gull. So your most likely other option is the lesser black back gull, um, or in fact, the species we'll move on to next. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, so good good point about the legs, um, but it does mean you have to kind of lean on other features to to try and identify gulls often if they're not in that full adult plumage. So yeah, easy to get another, caught up. Another another ID question from Alison. So she's asked us if we can talk a little bit more about the differences of gulls in flight, mm. um, because obviously we're showing a lot of pic static pictures. We, we have had a few pictures in flight, and you mentioned the common gull. Um, so yeah, we can touch on that a little bit as well. Um, but a size is going to be a big part of that, isn't it? That, yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. Yep, size is always always a good good clue. Um, and basically, I think with um, with with a lesser black back gull, it'll look generally on its back anyway, just very dark in flight. Um, you know, because it's got that darker back, uh, as we call the mantle color. Um, it doesn't contrast as much with the wingtip, um, which you can see on this this bird in particular is a is a jet black wingtip, and um, it doesn't contrast that much with the rest of the back of the bird. 
Um, so that will carry through in flight as well. Um, and um, there's a couple of slides, I think, later on, actually, of some sort of birds in, in, in a bit more flight. So actually, we can we can touch on this a little bit more later again. Um, yeah. But yeah, size, like you say, Jamie, size is, is a key thing. Um, and leaning on that sort of, you know, does the wingtip contrast dramatically or not so much with the back colour as well? That's all useful, useful stuff to be picking up on. Yeah, thank you, Alison. We'll touch on that a bit more later. Let's go to go past the video. Oh, isn't this the greatest, the greatest, the biggest cull in the world? Is that is that true? It is. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're, we're quite lucky in the UK to um to get the biggest uh, gull species in the world, the great black back gull. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this is actually a bird that I uh, that I found over the years uh, talking to lots of people about gulls. Um, is is one that's strangely more difficult to ID for some reason. And I think it's just because of sort of a few sort of myths and perhaps some old bird books that kind of talk about certain features. But for me, this bird generally stands out quite, you know, almost by a mile because of its size. It's enormous. Just looking at this bird sort of in isolation without comparing it to anything else, you know, the size of that beak is enormous. Um, and it uses that beak for uh, for things like breaking into carcasses on coastal, you know, so if you imagine a sort of a cetacean carcass or something washes up on a beach, great blackbacks will be the, the first bird in there to start um, breaking through uh, and start eating the, eating, eating whatever is available. Um, but um, yeah, so if we pop them there, there we go, perfect. So just to compare it, um, you know, it's a, it's a big old bird. It's got a very dark gray back. Um, again, not quite black. Well, it is almost black, I think, with this one to fear, fair to say. Um, and it's got pink legs instead of uh, yellow compared to the lesser black butt gull. Um, so that's, I think that's where, I think traditionally that's where lots of birders have been tripped up, I think, when thinking about gulls is that you rely on the leg colour quite a lot because the books show, you know, they, they point out one of the key differences between great and lesser black butt gulls is the leg colour. Um, and what they sometimes fail to sort of focus on is the fact that great black back gulls are blinking enormous um, compared to the uh, the lesser black back gull. Um, so if actually if you go to the next slide, that shows, I think it shows the um, the kind of difference quite nicely in that, uh, yeah, so on the right is a great black back gull. And you can see the other three that are terrified of it <laughs> um, because it's, it's taken their space and it's clearly very dominant. Um, they're all flying off and they're lesser black back gulls. Um, and to me, they're, they're sort of dwarfed by comparison, aren't they? They're, they're really quite small. Um, so, yeah, and that does touch upon another feature of the great black back gull um, is that um, if they're bullying other gulls or any other bird around them, um, it's probably a great black back gull because they really do sort of rule the roost. They're, they're often in charge. <laughs> When we when we're talking about the flight, just going back to the flight question earlier, mm. are we thinking of something that's almost kind of buzzard size, that that kind of thing? If we're if we're looking at these. Uh, so I I would say great blackback are sort of almost you know bigger than buzzard size for wow. sure. Um, yeah. you know they're very long winged and very bulky in in flight. Um, and you know it's not uncommon. You know I I go bird watching in in Pool Harbour quite a lot, and uh, you know often looking out for ospreys in the summer and the autumn. Um, and, it, and at distance, you know, when I'm scanning out across the harbour, you know, if you see a very large bird, um, you know, it can often be a great black back gull. And for a split second, you might think, oh, is there an osprey there? And then you sort of look a bit closer. And, no, no, no. Another another great black back gull or something. But, um, yeah, they are very, very big birds. And, uh, yeah, and stand out just just because they're big. You know, the flight's very slow and sort of quite sort of cumbersome and um, um yeah, but these are in terms of where you'll see the great black back gull. Actually, they're they're pretty much a coastal bird. Um, they're they're often associated with you know the seaside or out to sea. Um, nest wise, you know they nest on lots of um, lots of sort of islands and sort of more sort of offshore places. Uh, maybe a few cliffs and things like that. But um, so if you're inland, um, you might get lucky and see the odd one for sure. Um, I've seen them, you know periodically inland uh, often in very very small numbers just ones and twos um but yeah one to look out for more at the coast so again going back to confusing them with the lesser black back gull um you're much more likely to see lesser black backs inland than a greater black back gull so um there we go all done to let's like let's, we've got one last great black back so let's have a look at that it's a lovely close-up um beautiful show showing, showing, yeah showing green. its sweetest side <laughs> yeah showing its yeah. sweetest side absolutely <laughs> 
Um, let's move on to some of the uh, not rare, scarcer, scarcer goals. I think we would say that mm. you won't see as as what well, they're not as widespread, are they? So let's take this one to start with Mediterranean goal, which I said earlier we have a a, a similar species to blackhead, and then this is the one. Are these mostly found in southern England, Luke? At the moment, yeah. Although um, one of the big reasons actually for bringing them up here is that they are spreading quite rapidly. Um, so this is a bird that, um, you know, it's called Mediterranean gull. Um, I'm going to refer to it as med gull generally because that's what lots of birders do. Um, it's too much of a mouthful seemingly to say Mediterranean every single time. Um, and they're often shortened to med gull. Um, but they're not, um, they're a bird that breeds generally across across Europe, so not necessarily just around the Mediterranean. Um, huge populations in France, Belgium, Holland, um, places like Poland as well. Um, but yeah, they're, they're starting to really increase in, in the UK. Um, they're not rare at all in some places. I mean, when, when I started bird watching, crikey, maybe 20 odd years ago, um, you know, this was a bit of a rarity and you had to go to certain places to to hope to see med gulls. Um, mine was, uh, there was a, there was a very small population around um, Swansea by the Mumbles, which is on the, on the Gower, if anybody knows it. Um, there was always a few there. Um, but, you know, it was a special trip to go and see the med gull. Whereas now, if I pop over to Weymouth, um, I could see anything up to two, two and a half thousand of them um, in winter, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and they're breeding in increasing numbers as well throughout quite a lot of uh, wetlands along the south and the um, the east coast as well. So, you know, bird we definitely need to um, start um, sort of looking out for. Um, yeah, almost almost year round, but much more in winter. So, um, yeah. So ID wise. So um, they're they're about the same size as the the black headed gull that we so focused on. This is a, so this is a smaller gull. Um, probably sort of a little bit bigger than the black-headed gull, slightly smaller than the, the common gull. Um, but um, in terms of identifying, this is a nice adult. Um, so it's got white wingtips, which is interesting. We've not seen that on any of the species so far. Um, so you can tell it's an adult because it's got no speckling along the back. It's just lovely, clean, light grey colour. So this is, we're looking at an adult bird here. Um, and yeah, it's got that white wingtip, which makes it uh, quite distinct from the, the black-headed gull. Um, is that obvious like in flight? Sorry, sorry, Luke. Is that obvious yeah. in flight? Let's go back to the earlier question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, when you see them in flight, they do look very, very white. Um, to, to the point that, I mean, where I'm sitting right now, I've got a big sort of window above me. Um, and in fact, Right the second, I've got a load of black headed gulls flying over, uh, all getting a bit wet because it's pouring with rain. Um, but actually, I, I can sometimes clock a Mediterranean gull flying over with them because of the whiter wings. It looks almost a bit translucent at times. So they do um, they do stand out in flight. Um, but this is, a, an, yeah, we've got a nice sort of comparison here with the um, the darker wingtip on the black headed gull and the white on the, um, the adult Mediterranean gull. And I have to emphasise that, the, the adult Mediterranean gull, because younger ones do have black wingtips, unfortunately, um, which means you have to rely on other features to uh, to identify, you know, get that identification uh, bang on. But there's another feature here that I find really useful. Um, if you look at the beak, um, the beak on the black-headed gull on the right is quite narrow, sort of quite pencil sort of thin. It's quite, you know, it's narrow, quite pointy. Uh, the Mediterranean gull always has a chunkier beak. Um, and that's just to do with what they eat. Um, Mediterranean gulls love sort of foraging and um, ones in Weymouth seem to sort of feed on various sort of shellfish and things like that. So they have a chunkier beak to kind of cope with that. Um, but that's a nice little clue. Um, med gulls actually do have black heads, uh, unlike the black headed gull, uh, much blacker um, and more extensive as well. It kind of comes right down the back of the head uh, onto the part of the bird called the nape, which is essentially the back of the head. Um, and uh, again, it's got this little uh, white uh, little patches around, around its eye, which I find quite sweet. Um, but um, yeah, so it's it's, it's, a, it's a bird you'll get to grips with. I think the more you see it, um, especially comparing with all the gulls around it, if you've got black-headed gulls, particularly that's really useful to compare. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll definitely get familiar. Um, and they've got a really cool call, actually. They, they sort of meow, like uh, it's very cat-like. Um, which is again very different from black headed gull, and um, they'll start calling down here in Dorset very soon um, as the breeding season approaches. But um, fascinating bird, though. I think this this uh, this last picture uh, we've got a little story about this one, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. So one of my sort of hobbies, I guess, in in winter 
um, again, unsurprisingly, at Radipole Lake Car Park. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, if you look carefully at this bird, you can see it's got a, a little ring on its leg. And I, I did mention um, the, the, the ringing earlier on, and that it's a useful way of sort of knowing where they go. Um, but lots of gulls can sometimes carry these larger uh, plastic rings that have a really obvious visible code on them. Um, so if you've got um, if you've got a telescope or a good camera, you can often kind of get a picture and zoom in uh, and see see the see the number on that bird. Um, and this particular bird uh, so was a three C three eight. So this was one I, I, I took a picture of a uh, number of years ago. Um, but I dug out the life history of this bird recently. Um, a friend of mine who's uh, who's from Belgium, uh, Renaud, he, uh, he he very kindly sent me the the details. Um, and this was this bird was ringed on the 21st of May in 2005 um, as a chick. So somebody would have gone to the colony and uh, put rings on as many chicks as they possibly could um, and then kind of leave them alone. Um, and then from there, it turned up in Weymouth in autumn 2007 um, and kept coming back to Weymouth every single winter until 2015. So this bird was, unfortunately, it just, just disappeared from there um, because it was regularly seen throughout, throughout the whole of its life. It was recorded uh, 85 times um, by lots of different people, um, lots of them in Weymouth, um, quite a few of them in Sussex as well. It used to have a little holiday to Sussex quite often in late winter. Um, but it builds up a fantastic life history of, you know, where the bird came from, where it's wintering, um, you know, and then where it goes off to breed and the movements between those locations. And it and it does give us that little bit of insight into what's sort of changing with med gulls. Um, and they are definitely shifting and choosing Britain to, to come to more, especially in winter. So, um, yeah, it's fa fascinating stuff. And if you see if you see a, a ringed gull and you, a, ring, a gull with a ring on its leg, I won't, I won't start talking about other species. A gull with a ring on its leg um, and you can read it. There is a website you can go to to look it up. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to pop that in the in the chat, I believe. Uh, yeah. There we go. Up, 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 crbirding.org. It's, it's great. You kind of go in and you select all the different sort of the species that you've seen and the colour and the codes of the ring. Um, but if you do see one and you send off the date, the, uh, the your sighting, um, you get its whole life history sent back to you. And it's it's brilliant to see you kind of adding to that uh, sort of big data set and you can learn more about the birds. And, and that car park, again, um, I spent, well, in one afternoon once, I recorded, I, I'm sure it was seven different countries where med gulls had originated from. Um, and there was even a bird from um, Serbia. Uh, there was one from, uh, there were several from Germany. Uh, there was a Polish bird there. There was also uh, one once from Italy, um, which I've only ever recorded one uh, Italian med gull. And it was ringed near Venice, uh, the lag big lagoon near, near Venice, which I... I kind of painted a fantastic picture in my mind of where that bird bred, uh, sort of gondolas and all sorts of things floating around it, but um, probably not the reality. But hey, um, but yeah, it's really, really worthwhile um, and a bit of citizen science that, um, you know, everybody can get stuck into. So, um, yeah, a bit of fun on the side. <laughs> okay. Brilliant fun, but use, as you say, useful data. Uh, we've got two more species to look at. Let's look at uh, the yellow legged gull. So, again, not one you're going to see regularly or in large numbers. No, no, ab absolutely. Um, but again, it's, it's one to be sort of aware of as a species that's increasing in the UK. Um, from an identification perspective, this these are hard, to be honest. Um, they're kind of, um, how best to describe them? They're kind of, they're quite herring gull-like in lots of ways um, in terms of that sort of lightish grey back, um, dark wing tips. Um, it's got yellow legs, obviously, as the name suggests, um, as an adult. Um, some, you know, we talked about earlier on how the, the leg colour isn't always necessarily um, applicable until it's a, a full adult at about four years old with, with this species. Um, so at that age, they get the yellow legs. Um, but they're a bigger bird, actually, than herring gull. That's one thing I've always spotted with them is that they're they're a bit bigger, um, the beaks are chunkier, um, and they're a little bit more, even more brutish than the herring gull. I've seen them bullying herring gulls. They go around and push them out of the way. Um, but it's they are increasing in Britain. Um, there is a, the odd pair starting to nest. I think up until a few years ago, it, um, and probably still is, our rarest seabird nesting in Britain. I think there was always just one pair in pool uh, for a number of years, but they're likely to start increasing at some point. Um, but if you go abroad, um, so I'm thinking, you know, lots of, uh, you know, Spanish seaside resorts, uh, for instance, um, the, the commonest gull and probably 
the only gull you really see uh, around those sort of areas are the yellow leg gulls. So um, if you're if you're on holiday soon, um, then you can get very familiar with the the yellow leg gull because that's that's what you'll that's what you'll be seeing essentially is uh, is this sort of very Mediterranean species, um, but pushing north quite quickly. We've got another picture now, which is this. This picture is slightly baffling, but perhaps you can explain it to us. <laughs> yeah, this is. Uh... So portraying myself as rather sad here. I used to spend all my afternoons, you know, in the in the winter time, uh, you know, doing this sort of stuff. Uh, but looking for these sort of de minute details. Um, so in terms of the the mantle color, um, the back color. Um, so the bird in the, I say the middle. Um, you can see the kind of three big gulls in that picture. Um, the sort of middle one, um, is your your adult herring gull with a nice light grey back. Um, the bird on the left, um, and you can see its yellow legs there, um, is the lesser black back gull with that darker grey back. Um, but the bird on the right is essentially an intermediate between the two, uh, I'd say anyway. It's kind of that that grey is a, is a sort of mid grey between the herring gull and the lesser black back gull. Um, and you know, I think if you squint or use your imagination, you can sort of see it slightly chunkier than the herring gull, maybe. Um, again very small details um, and that but that bird in particular i think from memory when taking that picture it was something like a fourth winter bird so it wasn't quite full full adult um so the leg color in the in that on that bird isn't quite full on yellow yet but it it definitely has a yellow tint um but these are the sort of details when you get uber into gulls and you've kind of mastered all the common ones these are the sort of things you start to look for <laughs> So the, the last girl we're going to look at is, I think this is one of my favourite because I've seen these on in the, on Norfolk coast at places like Titchwell. Uh, let's go back to the previous one, please. It's uh, the Glaucus gull. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And, and from an identification perspective, these actually are not too tricky, um, but they are sort of a, a winter rarity in the UK. So we, we only see these in winter. Um, often they're first winter birds, they're young ones as well, that have kind of come down all the way from the Arctic. Um, so yeah, there's 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 two species actually to to talk about here. There's the Glaucus gull, which is which is this fella, um, with its uh, big old chunky beak, um, always two toned. It's kind of pink at the base and black at the tip. Um, and then there's also the Iceland gull, which is very similar to this, um, bit daintier. That's kind of that's all really. Um, but the key for this bird is that it's a big gull. Um, Glaucus gulls could be almost the size of great blackback gulls, but they've got white wing tips. And that's that's always the the key to identifying, you know, the the Iceland gull and the Glaucus gull. It's one of the big gull species, so you know, not to be confused with the med gulls with its with their white wings as well. They're much smaller. You wouldn't confuse them with with one of these for sure. Um, so this is a big gull with white wing tips. Um, but yeah, each winter's different though. Some winters we don't get many in the UK. Um, some winters we get quite a lot. Um, and it depends on the conditions right up in the Arctic as to whether they they venture down um, or not. And, um, you know, they're, they're very scarce where I am right on the south coast. But, you know, like you said, Jamie, in Norfolk, we get them. Um, and the further north you go in Britain, the more likely you are to encounter uh, one of these uh, white wing gulls, as we kind of generally call them, Iceland gulls slash Glaucus gulls. Um, but, um, yeah, but they do stand out. Um, they like a harbour. I've seen lots just hanging around harbour, um, often on their own. Um, because they're a bit of a rarity, you're not off, you're not going to get sort of flocks of these things. Um, but um, yeah, it's an extra added challenge, and you know it's exciting when you find a any rare any rare bird. Um, but this is this is one that uh, you know is always exciting when um, when you're gull watching. Talking of flocks, the last bit we've got is a flock. <laughs> what was going on in this one? Yeah, so this this is a is a great way to sort of um, sum up really gull watching because you know we've said all along that it's it's a challenge, um, you know there's lots and lots of things to consider. Um, it takes time to really get used to all the different gull species and how to identify them uh, and picking out the details. Um, it's it's not easy, um, and this is this is Radipole Lake, um, and this is there was a flock of about three to four thousand gulls sitting on the lake. Um, and I was looking for one gull in particular. There was a ringed bill gull, which is a, a North American species that's very similar to the common gull. Um, and there was one of them, it, like I said, in that flock of about 3,000 gulls. And uh, just as I got onto it, just as I sort of saw it, um, this happened. And then it takes you another hour to find it again <laughs> um but you know it, it just goes to show what can happen when you're gull watching um in theory you know all these hints tips are really useful and the bird books are really useful um but out in the field 
yeah, when this happens, it's always a bit of a uh, big sigh and uh, yeah. things start start again. But yeah, open his sperm or have another cup of coffee. Um, it, this will be a great jigsaw, I think. Picture. Okay. Um, we have had some questions in actually. Um, so I'll do the Mediterranean girl questions first because there's, there's quite a few of them. Okay. Uh, Hazel, who I think shares your interest in the car park at Radipol Lake yeah. for girl watching, <laughs> um, says that there's a lot of Mediterranean girls uh, amongst Hazel only ever sees Mediterranean girls amongst black headed girls, including the car park at Radipol Lake, never on their own. Um, is that a case of safety in numbers? So the Mediterranean girls hanging out with black headed girls. And also, what is it about the car park at Rad? I mean, we, we, we need to stop talking about the car park at Radipole. Like other <laughs> other nature reserves are available. Um, what is it about the you know places like that that makes them so appealing? Yeah, so it's a kind of safety numbers principle. Um, the flock is always always you know in it's always that principle applies. I think with gulls in particular, um, they often congregate around um, good food sources or good roost sites or good you know uh, somewhere to sort of bathe or drink or something like that um so it's it's generally because the location is great for gulls that you get these flocks um so yeah that's that's kind of why you see them in yeah. flocks um but okay. radical park car park in particular the reason that's that's great is there's lots of feeding nearby there's there's the harbor there's weymouth bay which is lots of food there's the the fleet which is uh the bit of water um near chesil beach uh, the world famous chesil beach um, so lots of feeding opportunities and med gulls are well known for going inland to feed as well. And near Weymouth, there's a lot of kind of arable land that they go off and feed on. So lots of food. Radipole Lake in particular is is good. They roost in Weymouth Bay, um, but Radipole Lake is en route to Weymouth Bay. So um, they've been feeding all day. So you can imagine the med gulls, you know, dipping into the sea or feeding in muddy fields, um, you know, there's eating all day long, getting getting messy as well. They're getting salt or their feathers and mud and stuff. And um, they often like to have a bath before they go to bed, which is okay. actually quite sweet. <laughs> so they drop into Radpool Lake, have a quick bathe. They dry off on the car park, which is why they like to sit on the car park. Um, they, yeah. they often preen um, and just kind of dry off and sort their feathers out on the car park um, before heading off to roost then in Weymouth Bay. That's really um, sweet. And, and you can imagine like goals up and down the UK doing exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. Two other quick observations on um, Mediterranean Gulf. Neil says Brown Sea Island's good for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's but we 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 were we were thinking so too. Um, uh, Alan uh, in uh, says we um, we see the med gull in east central coastal Scotland at this time of year. So they are they are sort of yeah. spreading about. Yeah. Um, then Conrad says one of the pictures of med gulls showed a grey blotchy head. Do the heads change colour like black headed gull? Yes, they do. So in winter, it does the same thing as a black headed gull, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that, that is right. Um, but one key difference, actually, the black-headed gull tends to have a bit of a spot in winter behind the eye. Black-headed yeah. gulls have more of a mask, more of a smudge. So the, the Mediterranean gulls is, is smudgy, black-headed gull is a little dot behind the eye. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, Caroline says, do the different gulls hybridise? We the last the last session we did we were about ducks, so we were talking about a lot of thoughts about how duck hybridisation. Did we get that with gulls? It's not as common with duck uh, as it's with ducks, um, but it does happen for sure. So, you know, one of the things that can really trip people up, do you remember that picture earlier on with the, the yellow leg gull with the herring gull and the black and the lesser black back gull, that kind of gradient of greys as we went from light through to dark. So technically, if a, and this does happen, lesser black back gulls can hybridise with herring gulls. And that will give you essentially a halfway between the two, which could look a lot like a yellow leg gull. Um, at a glance in terms of its mantle colour anyway. Um, so yeah, they they will. Um, I've seen a, a med gull cross with a black-headed gull in Radipole. I've seen one, just, just one, just one. Um, so again, in thousands and thousands of uh, gulls I've seen there, that, you know, it's a very rare event. Um, but yeah, the, the most common is a is a lesser black bat cross herring gull um, that seems to pop up from now and, you know, now and again. But, um, but yeah, you do get fascinating hybrids too. You know, there's... Um, uh, birds that have, you know, migrated or, or gone the wrong, gone to the wrong country, essentially. So you get these kind of strange hybrids between, you know, glaucous gulls nesting with herring gulls in in Norway sometimes, and I think there's even cases of birds turning up here that have probably come from North America, and they've there's kind of different hybrids there between glaucous gulls and the American high American herring gull as well, and yeah, but that's a whole different talk. 
<laughs> yes, that's a more that's more advanced. Um, Neil says, why do girls tap their legs up and down on grass? Now I've seen this. Uh-huh. I, think, I, think herring, I think herring girls, maybe lesser black bats do this. Um, yeah, mainly is, many, yeah, 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 mainly herring girls. Um, I think uh, are still the only ones I've seen doing it anyway. Um, and it's a it's a little sort of rain dance essentially. So it's a little dance that mimics rain hitting the soil, uh, which makes worms come to the surface. So um, and then they eat the worms. So yeah. pretty clever. clever and, and, and this is something we we, we keep trying to emphasise in this in this webinar that these are very these are clever birds. They they <laughs> clapped well a lot of them are kleptoparasitic. They they know if a if a bird or a human is accessing food that they can't get to themselves that they can go and snatch it. And they <laughs> they learn these techniques. I mean, gulls I think as well as crows will drop shellfish from from a height, weren't they, to to break it break it open? Yeah. So yeah. they're they they're bright birds. Um. I've got one. We've got one time for one final question. This okay. is from Beth. Okay, super quick. Go I just go back to that last question on the go on, um, go on, go on. running out. I'm really running out of time. But yeah, one of the things that really shows that they're super clever. When I when I catch them to put the rings on, and I've got to kind of lure them in with a bit of food, and I kind of hold them. Yeah. It's, you've got to be good at it very careful um but when i'm doing that i have to take about three or four different uh, types of clothing and different colored hats and things because once i've caught one or two they know exactly what i'm up to and they won't come near me i have to change my whole clothing then try again and might catch one more but then i have to try a change again and um and, and they actually remember you week by week so um i have to change locations all the time it's That's you know they're, they're really really clever birds so uh oh yeah goodness so the, yeah so you're wearing lots of different disguises now gosh um bev says we often see girls on inland water now does this cause a problem for other inland water birds like competing for food um potentially i mean when we see big numbers of gulls at sort of inland uh sort of reservoirs or wetlands they're often kind of roosting there so they're not generally feeding or doing causing much other sort of problem to other birds, I'd say anyway. So, you know, lots of their feeding will be done at um, places like landfill sites. You know, they do love going to a landfill site and scavenging. So um, they're probably not impacting other birds um, too much. So, um, you know, I so I think generally they don't cause too, too much of an issue in that respect, I think. Good to know. Um, right, we're going to wrap up shortly. I just wanted to let you know that we do have some more online sessions for members coming up. Uh, these will be in April and May, and we're going to be looking at bird migration. So um, don't worry about writing all these down because we will send you an email after this session with all the links to register. But essentially, 23rd of April, um, and these are all 12 noon to 1 p.m., by the way, uh, some lunchtime. We're going to be doing a spotlight on swifts. Uh, very excitingly, we've got swift campaigner Hannah Bourne Taylor joining us um thank you for Luke for setting that one up but we're going to be talking all about swifts 30th of april um we're going to talk about special places so all the places that are important to migratory birds 7th of may we're talking about working internationally how we protect birds along the flyway we talked a lot today about all the different routes and places that gulls go to but you know once you open that up to all the different migratory bird species there's around 50 I think that we say migrate to and from the UK uh, for, and spend the summer here, for example. Um, you know, we talk about protecting birds along the flyway. And then the final session is the 14th of May when we're looking at some of those really amazing journeys and exploring the secrets of bird migration. As I said, don't worry about writing all that down. We will send you all those links after this session. We're also going to send you a quick uh, survey. Um, we welcome your feedback. Do let us know any other topics you'd like us to explore in the future. I'm always keen to provide what we can for RSPB members. And at this point, I should thank you as an RSPB member for everything you do for us, because we couldn't do all this work um, without you. We couldn't run all the nature reserves. We couldn't do the international work. We couldn't run Big Garden Birdwatch. Um, none of this would happen without your support. So thank you very much. And talking of thank yous, um, I think I should thank Luke, because he's done most of the talking today. Thank you so much, Luke, um, and for answering all those questions. And Anna and Claire from the events team who've been absolutely brilliant keeping this running smoothly behind the scenes. And thank you all for watching. We hope to see you at our next session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>